All right. Well, one of the things I was going to share with you is I spend a lot of time actually in depositions uh, uh, regarding medical issues. Occasionally, physicians are asked to care for people who've been injured in car wrecks or they've had accidents or were to give expert opinion. And so we go through these depositions. And I don't know if you've ever been in a deposition, but they are the most tedious thing in the world. Every word each attorney examines asks you to define words that you think are just very common. Every phrase and everyone trying to find an alternative interpretation. I'd like to say that, I th would, that they're seeking truth, and I'm sure somewhere deep in their heart they are, but, but it's how they get to it that sort of drives you crazy because they're constantly examining you. And you know that what you're saying is true, but it's frustrating because they're trying to examine you to prove it. But the real show gets started when you're cross-examined. That's when everything starts to get amped up. That's when the gloves come off, and that's hopefully when truth gets revealed. A lot of people get upset with the process of cross-examination. They don't like it, wondering why they just can't be believed as speaking truth and why everybody's so skeptical of what they're saying. I, I always saw cross-examination as necessary. We live in a world full of skeptics and doubters. It's not too surprising. Truth, truth is relative in our world. We've been forced to all essentially come from the show me state. Whatever anybody says, we're constantly in the, okay, now prove that. We're doing a series today. We're towards the end of Colossians. Paul has been warning about false teachers. He's told them their love for Jesus and for each other is going to show people the Father. Last week, we learned that our love for the people at home, our children, uh, our uh, wives, that, that, that shows the love of the Father. And it's strong evidence of the presence of Jesus in our lives. But now Paul's getting ready to tell them, get ready for the cross-exam. Get ready for the cross-examination. Get ready for the real skeptics. Because it's easy to take your love to church. It's easy to take your love home. But I'm going to ask you to take it to people who don't know me. I'm going to ask you to take the love of God that was poured out on the throne, and I want you to take it to people, not in your family, I want you to take it to unbelievers. I want you to take it to pagans. I want you to take it to people who hate Jesus. I want you to take it to people who have the strongest resentment towards you as a Christ follower. I'm asking you to take the love from the throne of God and pour it out on the strongest skeptics you can find. And he closes out the book of Colossians. And as he does that, we're going to look at the final C. We've been looking at these C's now for 16 weeks. We study the content, we see the list, we see the metaphors, we look at the verb tenses. We learned about context, the context that we bring to the text and the context that they bring to the text. We, we learn about how that applied in the first century and then we learn the connection. How to decide if the truth that we found is a timeless truth for all time or whether it should stay with the original audience. And now we get to the most critical step of all. This step, if not taken, makes all the other steps worthless. This step, if not done correctly, ruins everything we've been working for. Now we're going to look at conduct. We're going to ask the question of God, I understand your truth now. What do you want me to do? Notice the question's very specific. God, based on the truth that you've shown me, what do you want to do in my life? Remember, we're not the one changing. We're surrendering and being changed. Many never apply the timeless truth that they spent so much time learning because they asked the wrong question. The common mistake many believers get is they get to this point and they ask this question. How do I want to apply this truth to my life? What change do I want to make? Here's the problem. If you focus on how you want to apply change in your life, you'll never change. Because you and I will always choose compromise. We won't make the difficult change that God wants to make. We'll make the one that's just a little step towards him and makes us feel a little bit better about obedience. See, the question isn't, how do I change or what should I decide to do? The question is, Holy Spirit, how do you want me to apply this truth that you've shown me? 
What change do you want to make in my life? What do I need to surrender to give you room to do what you need to do? What am I doing that's keeping you, Holy Spirit, from changing me? The answer to every truth that we learn from Scripture is the same. It's God's truth, and we surrender to it. We don't debate it, we don't change it, we don't give our opinion on it, and we don't change anything in our lives because of it. As fallen humans, we're taught to go into the fix-it mode. We, we, we think when something goes wrong that we need to jump in and fix it. We want to control the process of change so we can determine how far and where the change goes. We come up with all kinds of ways of fixing ourselves. But the changes that God needs to make in you and me are supernatural. They come from the throne of God. They have to originate from Him and they've got to be applied by Him. There's no self-help in God's transformation of you and me. He doesn't need or want our help. What He wants is our surrender. I say it all the time. All God wants us to do is surrender and allow the Holy Spirit to be Lord of our life. When faced with God's truths, we agree and surrender like the old hymn, trust and obey for there's no other way. When God reveals a truth for you, we just surrender. We agree with God. Yes, that's true. I might not agree with it, but it's true because you're God and you say it's true. And then we ask the Holy Spirit to update us, to update our app, if you will. Change who we are based on that truth. We surrender and give permission. The rest is the work of the Holy Spirit. Recently, somebody asked me, why do you go to church? Why not just watch online? Why not just have a personal relationship with Jesus on your own? It's a common question that comes straight out of our arrogance. I can relate to Jesus better on my own than I can with other believers. They don't have anything they can teach me. I'm better than they are. They don't add to my spiritual walk with God. They're just messed up people, more messed up than me, and they're holding me back. You see, they bother me. These people that you call the church, they just bug me. They've got issues. They've got problems. I'd do better if I was just home by myself. So I spent several weeks thinking about that question. Why do I attend church? I know the sermons would be a lot shorter if I would stay home and watch online. <laughs> but seriously, why am I here? Why do we come here? Why are you here? Let me share with you the main reason that I decided I come to church. I'm saved by Jesus. I'm eternally reborn. But I'm seriously messed up. I have a sin nature that I can't control. I still have pride that I can't yet kill. I still have self-worship where I try to rise above God at times in my life. Part of my heart is still very wicked. That's the timeless truth of God's word that I can't deny. I'm saved, but I'm seriously flawed as long as I'm on this side of eternity. I attend church because I desperately need to change. I need to change almost everything about my life. It's a timeless truth of God's word that says change has to happen in the context of a loving community of believers. The Holy Spirit and those who are filled with Him, God has placed in my life to help me change. We're a collective group of very messed up people. We all have a sin nature, and it requires other believers and a Holy Spirit moving through us and the love of God for us to change. I come to church because I desperately need help. I need your help. I need you to help me become a better person. Every week I come here because I need to experience God's love through you. His love changes me and you have it. Sorry, can you mute me for a minute? This mic's driving me crazy. Mute, please. Am I muted? Thank you. Hold on. See if I can fix that. I have a feeling Satan doesn't want this message going out. All right, let's try it again. I come to church because I need help. 
You can unmute me now. <laughs> Am I unmuted? There it is. I come to church because I need help. And I need your help. I need you to show the love of God to me so that I can feel safe enough in that relationship and trust Jesus enough to do the difficult changes that he wants me to make. The things that drive us crazy about each other are the exact things that make church so incredible. We need to learn how to be gracious and patient and kind and merciful and encouraging. What better place to learn that than with a bunch of other people who are messed up who love Jesus? It is in the context of the love of a church family that we actually grow. We cannot do it at home by ourselves. It can't happen. If I'm going to become the man that God wants me to be, I need you in my life. And I need you messed up and yet being transformed by God as well. We're all to do the same. We grow together. That's God's word, not mine. I come to church, I study the scriptures so I know and understand God for one purpose. I need to be changed. We pan for this timeless truth and we're commit to change. And we have to decide in our heart before we ever look for the truth. We have to have the answer for God. God, I will do anything, anywhere, anytime. You just tell me what it is. There's no decision tree when it comes to God's truth. There's no question of what you're to do with it. You're to surrender and let the Holy Spirit apply it, take you wherever he wants to go, get you to do whatever he wants you to do. That's what it means to make Jesus the Lord of your life. A lot of people have made Jesus the Savior of their life, but they haven't surrendered to his Lordship. We don't read the Bible and then make a decision based on what it says. We make a decision to obey, and then we read the Bible. I finally got so frustrated with the sin in my life, with the struggle of sin, the things I couldn't stop doing, that I finally decided to stop trying, to stop sinning. I admitted to God, myself, and others that I was powerless to change myself. Whatever it was going to take to get me to kill the sin in my life, it wasn't going to come from me. Because if I had the ability to do it, I'd have done it. Because my heart wanted to change, but I couldn't do it. That's when I realized if I'm going to change, if I'm going to become like God, God's going to have to do it. And God says, yes, finally. You figured it out. You need me to change you. You can't change yourself. That's why you're so messed up. It's a timeless truth of Scripture that set me free. I could stop trying to stop sinning and just surrender, and God will change me to a person who doesn't want to sin. I can't create a new me. I'm not God. I got to a place in my life where I just surrendered. Got on my knees, said, God, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere, anytime you want. You just please don't leave me. And please, God... Don't leave me in charge. I've prayed that prayer every day since. If you're not committed to allowing the Holy Spirit to fully have control, to show you truth, to show you where to apply it, and then show you how to apply it, then don't study the Scriptures. If you're not committed to obedience, God's truth won't be revealed to you anyway. A lot of us have never opened God's word and met him in the pages because deep down he and we know that we're not really committed to doing what he wants us to do. God doesn't reveal his word, his truth, to those who seek it but aren't yet ready to apply it. So with that mindset, I want us to make sure we understand the difference between interpretation and application. Okay. The first three C's that we've been studying, context, content, or content, context, and connection, the purpose is to discover the truth to be revealed, and it's usually a singular truth. In other words, one truth, one thing that God wants us to see. It's a clear interpretation that's given to all of us. For example, last couple weeks ago, we said, knowing who we are in Christ sets us free. That's a truth. It's a timeless truth. It'll always be true. Knowing who you are in Christ sets you free. If you're not feeling free, you don't know who you are in Christ. 
Because as you spend more time knowing who you are in Christ, God says, I will set you free. So we know that's a truth. Every believer who's ever lived experienced that truth. It was true for David. It was true for Solomon. It was true for Peter. It was true for every disciple. It's true for you and me and Peter and Paul and Mary and everybody. Knowing who we are in Christ sets us free. That's the interpretation. But application usually has multiple options. When we get to conduct, that truth can, that truth can be applied in many ways. We know that knowing who we are in Christ sets us free, and then we turn to the Holy Spirit and we say, okay, how do you want to apply that in my life? When I taught that sermon, some came to me and said, look, I was really prompted by the Holy Spirit to change the way I respond to the expectation of other people. I understood that I have an audience of one now. Others were directed to change the way they respond to what advertisers are doing. Some were, at, were thinking by the Holy Spirit they need to reshape their idea of what beautiful really means. Some change the clothes they wear. Some, the Holy Spirit prompted to change and guard the new spiritual teachings and gurus that bombard our lives. The same truth, knowing who you are in Christ sets you free, but then the Holy Spirit says, and I'm going to apply that here, and I want to apply it over here, and I want to apply it over here. You just surrender. You just get yourself in position to be downloaded the new app. I'm going to update you in these areas with that truth. I'm not asking you to tell me where you want to apply it. I'm in charge of your life. Remember, I'm your Lord, right? Knowing who we are in Christ sets us free. Interpretation involves getting into the Word. What does it mean? What are the lists? What are the metaphors? How do we bring it forward? Interpretation is getting in the Word. Application is the Word getting into you and me. Now that I know the truth, what changes about me? Interpretation says, what is the truth that God put in the Scriptures? Remember we said the content belongs to the author. When God wrote His Scriptures, what is the truth that He put in there? Application asks, how does God want to insert that truth into my life? In our ending passage today, Paul begins to move our focus away from our church family, away from our home family, and begins to prepare us for a very challenging cross-examination that's going to come from non-believers, skeptics. Our passage today is Colossians 4, verse 2 through 6. If you want to start heading that way, there's a scripture sheet out in the lobby as well. Let me set the stage for where Paul's going to take us today. Paul is teaching that our new identity in Christ sets us free. Free to love those in our church family, free to love those in our family, and now Paul turns to those who don't believe. Paul is teaching new believers in Christ how to interact with people who don't believe. We forget sometimes how ridiculous what we say sounds to an unbeliever, to those who haven't experienced it. We're having a close encounter of the God kind, and it's hard to believe. I didn't believe it till it happened to me. Think about what you're asking people to believe. I talked to God this morning. You know, God, burning bush, split the sea, created the world, died on the cross, resurrected that God. Yeah, he spoke to me this morning. Turns out he's very interested in the details of my life. You see, I'm one of his adopted children. He guides me, he teaches me, he changes me. He takes time out of his duties running the universe to meet with me every morning. And you wonder why people want proof. Why are they skeptical? Because what we're telling them is supernatural. I didn't believe it till it happened to me. Do you remember when you first heard about it? Remember how weird that was? That dude thinks he talks to God. And I can't explain it, but I've experienced it. That's why we're called witnesses. Let me repeat that. That's why we're called witnesses. We don't have all the answers. We just have the experience. People always have to weigh and examine what witnesses say. They have to decide for themselves if they want to believe the witness. What they believe about the witness doesn't change the truth. You should expect intense scrutiny when you make outstanding claims. In court, every witness knows they're going to be cross-examined. Every witness. 
Jesus made some amazing claims. He said, hey, I'm God. I created everything. I created you. In fact, I'm above all things. I hold all things together. I'm God. I left my home and throne in heaven to come down here and be a human. I'm going to die on the cross for you, and then I'm going to resurrect. I'm going to overcome death. I'm going to save you from yourself. You see, death has no hold on me. I'm going to come out of the grave. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to hang out in heaven for a while, and then I'm going to come back and judge everybody who doesn't believe me. You'll be forgiven if you believe in me. If not, you'll spend all the rest of eternity, which never ends, in hell. You're going to be held accountable from your sins. And if you don't believe I'm who I say I am, you're going to be in hell for the rest of eternity. Why did they believe him? Well, here's the deal. They cross-examined him, and he was authentic. He did things only God could do. The winds and the seas obeyed him. He brought people and himself back to life. He healed people of horrible diseases. His response to being cross-examined was essentially, go for it. John 10, 25, Jesus said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness of me. John 14, 11, believe me that I am the Father and the Father's in me, or else on account of the works themselves. Jesus said, look, if you don't believe my words, if you don't believe what I say, then believe because the miraculous is happening. Jesus basically said, the miracles I bring into this world are evidence that I am who I say I am. And then he turns to us and he says, I want you to do the same thing. Because you're a miracle. Jesus told us to be his witnesses to the miracle that is our life. He didn't tell us to be scholars. He didn't tell us to have all the answers or try to defend what people find offensive about his truth. Jesus said, look, if you don't believe what I say, then believe because of the miracles that I show you. And we're to go to other people and say, look, if you don't believe the words of Jesus, then believe the miracle that he's done in my life. Because I couldn't have done it. Let me tell you where I was. Let me tell you what happened when I met Jesus. Let me tell you where I am. You see, the miracle is my life. You're standing in front of a miracle. A miracle of God. You want proof? This is who I was. This is who I am. This is how I met Jesus. And this is what's happened in my life. It's a miracle. This is our witness. This is our testimony. It's an outlandish claim. Our world is skeptical. They're not going to believe just anything you tell them. So many people try to pretend to be something they're not. We've learned to doubt everybody. We've learned to question everybody. It seems for the most part, no one is really who they say they are. It seems that there's not a product at all that's advertised correctly. Pay for this, it's going to wear out one week before we bring out our new version at Christmas. And it'll be twice as expensive, but it'll be the new one and you'll want it because the old one won't work anymore because we've put essentially a self-destruction in it. Churches have done their fair share of false advertising. Pastors on preaching immorality, and then it turns out they're entwined in it. Churches using God's name to manipulate people to give money. People use their position in church to acquire wealth or worth or worse. I don't blame people for looking at Christ followers with a cautious eye. What I'm surprised about is that we're surprised they're doing it. We take it personally. If I came in and made a crazy claim, you go, you probably should prove that. It's not anything about me. It's the claims crazy. Often we use lofty words, but we're living seedy lives. People are watching every one of us to see if we're authentic. If you really talk to God, if you really talk to him every morning, you should be very different from the people who don't. It's that simple. If the claims you're making are true, if God of the universe talked to you this morning, if he's changing you and transforming you, you should be dramatically different than people who don't talk to God every morning. 
You see, they're weighing the evidence in your life. They're watching what you say. They're watching what you do. They're watching the way you talk to other people. They're evaluating your actions to see if they match up to the promises you're making. They're looking for evidence of Jesus in you because that's the very miracle that God put in you. They're looking at you saying, do you look like your Savior? Do you act like your Savior? Do you love me the way the Savior loved me? But many of us have failed our own cross-examination. We've deceived ourselves when it comes to our faith. Many aren't honest with themselves about Jesus. They're faking it, and other people can tell. People love to expose a fake. One of the most damaging things that happens to us during the cross-examination of our lives is that we are asked to explain the sins and actions of other people who made claims about Jesus. I'm crushed when pastors are found to be deceptive. When their secret lives of sin are exposed in the light, it's crushing because they hurt the body of Christ. Their moral failures, their lies from the pulpit hurt every one of us. They turn seekers away from the very thing they need, and it's so frustrating. If you're not going to follow Jesus, if you're going to ignore him and his word and his truth, if the desire of your heart is to do what you want to do and not love and serve and obey Jesus, if you're not committed to doing what he says, then please quit saying you're a Christ follower because you're not. And you're hurting everybody else. I'm not asking you to be perfect. None of us can be perfect. But our heart's desire has got to be to live like our Savior lived. It frustrated Paul, too. He's going to tell the Colossians how to live under the scrutiny of outsiders. He knew they were about to be cross-examined. They want to see Jesus. The only way they're going to see Jesus is if he's in your life. Let's look at our passage, Colossians 4.2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. That I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In this passage, God's going to t- or Paul, God through Paul is going to tell us to do three things when it comes to preparing for our cross-examination. The first thing is, is we have to be positioned. Notice that Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer. He assumes you're already praying. He doesn't say begin praying. He says, continue praying. Don't stop. He says, and pray with thanksgiving. And he says, be watchful. What are we supposed to be watching for? Starts out on our knees, grateful hearts, and watching for the things of God in our life. Steadfast, persisting, consistent, being watchful in prayer, hoping that God's going to open a door that you can step through. You're like preparing yourself in prayer. You're like, God, I'm ready. You send me out to the world. You send a skeptic to me. I'm ready to be cross-examined. I can't wait to share with them the love you have for me. Just open the door. Paul's saying we should be like horses waiting for the gate to drop so we can run the race God has given us. There are people in the world that need to see Jesus in me. Turn me loose. We're watchful. We're on alert knowing we're soon going to be called to action, expecting God to move. God is going to arrange people to come into our lives that we can share the gospel with. We're expecting it to happen. We're praying that God will do it. Is that how you pray every day? Are you expecting God to use you to share the gospel with people who don't know? Are you expecting God to look at you and go, you're ready to be cross-examined? Are you more concerned about the advancement and the momentum of the gospel message going to the people you know and love than you are about your own issues? 
He says, look, you're going to be a witness when you walk in wisdom around other people. We've got to respect others. We've got to walk in wisdom. If we don't reflect Jesus, nobody cares what we say. Have you ever had somebody who's not walking it try to talk it? I'm not saying you have to be perfect, but people are watching your heart. We all have areas where we need to grow and change, and our growth in Christ never stops. I'm not saying we have to be perfect. We're all under construction. But outsiders can look at our lives and see our heart. And here's something else Paul says. It's very interesting. He says, they're going to come to you for answers. Be ready when they come to you for answers. Why are they going to come to you? You ever wondered, why you? Well, because they see something in you. They don't know what it is. They see a love, a joy, a peace, a patience, a kindness, a goodness, and and they know that it's not something they have. I was drawn to Christ because I saw his peace in somebody, and I'd never felt that kind of peace before. God's going to open a door. You're going to walk in wisdom. They're going to notice the miracle that is your life. You have something that comes straight from the throne of God. So Paul says, look, you've got to get positioned. You've got to get ready. God's going to use you. Second thing Paul says in this passage, you've got to be purposed. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. We're to be expectant. We're to have our eyes open. We're supposed to be watching for what God is doing in this moment. We're to have a sense of urgency that the gospel message has got to be poured out on people today. We've got to be intentional about telling other people about Jesus. God's going to open the door. We're to speak when the door's open. Our lives bring credibility to our words. Being purpose means we're in the moment, we're fully engaged right now, and we're expecting to be involved in supernatural things, moving the gospel forward. But it's hard to stay in the moment, isn't it? So many distractions. For some, it's the ghost of my life past that keeps me from being in the moment today. I'm so guilt-ridden about what I've done or what's happened to me. I'm so ashamed of where I've been and what's defined me. I'm so overwhelmed by my feelings of unworthiness and the lies that I've been believing that I can't live in the moment because I can't stop thinking about my past. And rather than being present in what God is doing today, rather than responding to the door that he's opening for me right now, I'm too busy trying to cover up, explain away, hide my guilt and shame about my past. I can't be purposeful for you, God, in this moment because I'm too busy focused on the moments that have already happened. Others are haunted by the ghost of my life yet to come. I'm so fearful of the future that I can't stay in the moment. I can't be focused on what God's doing in this moment, you see, because something might happen down the road. The doctor says something's going to happen in six months. I can't focus on today because I'm too focused on the days to come. My moments are full of worry and anxiety and thoughts about how to control the future. I can't live in the moment. I've got a future to control. And Satan's right there going, yeah, do whatever you want to do. Just don't stay in the moment. Because, see, the only time you can ever work for God is in the moment. Think about that for a minute. The only opportunity you have to ever be a witness for Christ is in the moment. You can't go back and do it in the past. You can't go forward and do it in the future. If you're going to be effective for Christ, it's got to be in the moment, right now. Wherever you are, whatever God is doing. So Paul tells everybody, you got to be positioned. you got to be purposed. you got to be ready. you got to be in constant contact with God. Can you imagine spending your day just constantly aware of what God's doing around you, fully engaged in what God's doing right now? Every conversation, every new person, each discussion, every interruption, not missing anything that God is doing in this moment. How do we live in the moment? Well, we pray earnestly. 
We expect God to do something with our lives today. It's why our hearts are beating. We expect that He wants to do something. We're watchful in our prayers with thanksgiving. We're constantly talking to the Holy Spirit. What's going on right now? Why is this interruption happening today? What do you want me to tell this person? Why did they end up here? I once witnessed to somebody that hit my car. Poor, poor girl, she just backed up and whacked my car. My first question was, God, why did this happen? I get out and she's bawling. I said, why are you crying? Well, I hit your car. And I said, it's okay. It's no big deal, I can get another car. I got insurance. What's your name? And she kept bawling. And I said, well, it sounds like something other than this is going on. And we talked about Jesus right outside of Office Max on uh, B Ridge and Tuttle. I told her, I said, don't worry about it. There's a God in heaven. He's got all this. And she said, what, did I run into a pastor or something? (laughs) That's when I said, no, you ran into a doctor. No, um, (laughs) we have to be ready. Every interruption in our life was allowed by the Holy Spirit. Think about that tomorrow. We don't dwell on our past because it's forgiven. We're not to dwell on our future because there's no, con- well, for our past because there's no condemnation for Christ in our future because he knows the plans he has for us. They're plans for good, not for disaster to give us a future and a hope. We don't have any reason to live anywhere except in the moment. We can't live in the past. It's gone. We can't live in the future. It may never happen. The thing that's incredible about Jesus is he always lived in the moment. The third thing we have to do is we have to be prepared. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Every one of us who follows Jesus has a story. We have an experience with Jesus to share with other people. Your story may only be three days old or it may be 50 years old. But Christianity is not about some new morality. It's not a new way to live. It's not about some new philosophy. It's not a religion. Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus, an encounter with God that changes who we are. It's not a new set of rules to follow. It's not some mystery thing that we've discovered. It's not about finding stronger willpower to be a better person. It's not about committing to some new rules. It's about encountering and falling in love with Jesus. Our lives are transformed because we've met Jesus. Christ followers have witnessed something they can't stop talking about. That's what drives everybody crazy. And Paul says, look, if you're going to talk it, you're going to get cross-examined. You need to walk in wisdom. It means we don't just know the truth, we've actually applied, allowed the Holy Spirit to apply the truth. We're not just full of knowledge about Jesus, our lives reflect Jesus. Our lives have become authentic because he's authentic and he'll stand up to any cross-examination. Walking in wisdom means we don't just talk it, we walk it, not some of the time, all the time. Not just here at church on Sunday, all the time. Our words to others should be gracious. Grace comes from a grateful heart. Grace is found in humility. Grace is unmerited favor, speaking well of other people. I'm not good at this, just letting you know. Rather than judging them, assuming the best motives of people until we know otherwise. Putting their needs first, walking in their shoes for a while. Our speech should be full of grace. Did you notice that Paul said, always? It means that we should be full of grace even when we think no one's watching. Always. It doesn't mean that you wait until the topic turns to church and Jesus until suddenly you decide to turn on the grace. Have you met those people screaming at their kids, telling you the patience and peace they feel from Jesus? Our speech should always be grace-filled to everybody all the time. And he says it should be seasoned with salt. We're to include salt in our discussions. What does that mean? Well, it means that not only should we speak truth, not only should we be gracious, but salt represents God's truth, not backing away from the truth. And notice that it's the seasoning, not the main ingredient. 
the main ingredient of our message is grace and mercy and God's love and what he's done in our lives. Salt is the seasoning, not the subject. A lot of people take the message of God, they amp it up, they make it so condemning, so mean, so angry, that all it is is salt and nobody can handle it. Too much grace and we tolerate anything. Too much salt and we're judging everybody. It means the truth of God in our discussion should be present but not overpowering. People should leave discussions with you thinking, that was a perfect dish of grace. Just enough truth to know it's there. Just enough truth to not judge me, but to get me interested. It was perfect. It was a perfect style. This message may not only be declared, it's got to be tailored to each person's circumstances. It's a very personal message. You put the amount of salt in it that they need. In the Gospel of John, he reportedly says Jesus is full of grace and truth, perfectly balanced. All the truth in the world, perfectly balanced with grace. And we should be like it. Did you notice in this passage what he says? Each person. How you interact with each person is different. It's not a one thing fits all people. This message is hugely personal. People want to know you care about them. They want to know that you have a relationship with them. Then the message can come. Each person is going to have different questions, different concerns, different circumstances. But for some reason, God's going to put them in your path so that you can link with them. Too many Christians way overpower the message with salt. And those they encounter never experience grace. They leave feeling judged and condemned. We leave no room for God's grace, and they say that we just judge them. We're to take our experiences, we're to walk in wisdom. We're to speak in grace, we're to season it with truth, we're to personalize it for each person. We're to declare the mystery of Christ. This is what's happened in my life. It has to be revealed. God wants to use each of us to reveal himself to people that we know who have a relationship with us. He wants us to declare the mystery of Christ. Almost every person that comes to know Jesus will tell you these three things aligned in their life. The mess, the message, and the messenger. Something in your life, the mess, forces you to seek answers from God. God's message is receptive to you for some reason, and now it suddenly seems true. And then God brings a messenger full of grace and truth, and you're like, I want what they have. I see Jesus in them. Someone who's walking in wisdom. When you claim something extraordinary, people have a right to ask you questions. They have a right to doubt you. They have a right to cross-examine you. You're making some crazy claims. Almost everyone who surrendered to Jesus did because they met somebody who was authentic. Someone who stood up to cross-examination. Someone who didn't get defensive and said, yeah, but wait till you meet Jesus. Well, how is it possible? Just wait till you meet Jesus. I can't explain everything. I don't know where dinosaurs came from. I don't know how. All I know is that God is in my life, and I talked to him this morning. He'll tell me the rest of that when I need to know it. We've experienced the unbelievable, supernatural experience with a living God. Almost every one of us, if we look back in our walk with Christ, we'd say, you know what? One of the reasons I'm here is because I met somebody who was authentic. I met somebody who represented Jesus. So Paul tells them, look, you've got to be positioned, you've got to be purposed, and you've got to be prepared. So I want to give us some homework as we plan to leave today. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to get your testimony ready. Okay? 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. I want you to make sure you can tell your story in a very short time. This is who I was, this is where I met Jesus, and this is what he's done in my life. I was a materialistic, anxious, 
worried about everything, thought I was in control of everything. I, I stayed up nights with anxiety and worry. I was almost non-functional. And then I saw a peace in somebody. I didn't understand where that peace came from, but I knew I had to have it. I'd never seen anybody go through what they were going through with such peace. So I asked them and they told me about Jesus. I didn't believe it. It was crazy. So I, I went to church and I began to ask Jesus, I need your peace. If you're real, I need that peace. And amazingly, he met me there. I can't explain it. I don't have all the answers, but here's what I'll tell you. I don't worry about a thing anymore. I have a peace that doesn't come from me. I have problems. I have issues. But let me tell you, I found a peace that came straight from God. And every day I meet him and every day he floods me with his peace. You see, this is who I was. This is what happened. And this is who I am now. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is what he has done through me. Go ahead, examine me. I don't have the answers. I just have the truth of what's happened in my life. You're going to get cross-examined, and you need to be ready. Once you have your story ready, I want you to share it with somebody in your church family. It should be less than three to five minutes. You should be able just to go through it relatively quickly. You're not asking to explain the gospel. You're, what you're doing is you're explaining the authenticity of the gospel in your life. We're going to start sharing our testimonies as part of our worship service. Uh, we're going to have people start getting up and telling you in three to five minutes, this is who I was, this is what Jesus did, this is what I've learned. Second, pick one day this week, just one day, pick whatever day you want, and live in the moment. Try your hardest to live in the moment. When your mind wants to go to the past, let it go. When it wants to go to the future, let it go. Just spend your whole day saying, God, what's happening right now? What's going on around me? What do you want me to do in this moment? Where can I show people you? Will you open a door, God? Because I'm prepared. I've got my story if I need it. I've got you in my life. I'm walking in wisdom. God, would you just give me a chance to live in the moment today? Ask Jesus to be your tour guide. You ever notice when you're on a tour, they stop. Oh, look over there. You see that? That's where so-and-so, or that's so-and-so. You say, Holy Spirit, be my tour guide today. You see that person over there? They're hurting. Will you go talk to them? It'll be okay. They're hurting. I need you to go. I brought you here so you can go talk to them. Do you notice that woman and that child over there in the corner, the child sitting in mom's lap? That's how I love you. I brought that picture to you so you could see that in this moment. You see, my love for you is like that. You see that person over there that needs food? They, they, they believe no one's here. I, I'm, we're here to provide for them. We live in the moment. We allow the Holy Spirit to show us what's going on. I want you to spend another day just thinking about your speech, what you say to people, every word that comes out of your mouth. Commit to being ready to bring God's truth into the circumstance as a seasoning and lead them to ask for a deeper meal. Finally, pick someone who doesn't know Jesus and pray for them. Pray expectantly. Pray that God will open a door. Pray that their heart will soften, that the circumstances of their life, that the message, the messenger, and the mess will all collide. That God, if he wants to, will use you as part of that process. And when the doors open, Jesus is the one they see because they see him in you. Pray with a watchful eye. Be expectant. Be ready to be used. Let God know that you're available. I'm positioned. I'm purposed. I'm prepared. God, send me. Almost every week I speak to people who desperately want somebody they love to come to Jesus. They want them to experience the love and the joy and the peace that they've experienced. Their lives have been radically transformed. God tells them. Be positioned, be purposed, be prepared. Because God says, I'm going to open a door. And when I open that door, I want my gospel to go forward. There's no reason, God says, to fear the cross-examination of other people. No reason to fear it at all. You should expect it, you should embrace it. We need to remember that it's a cross-examination. They're examining the claims of Jesus, not you. They're examining the miracle of Jesus that is you, not you. 
We are not sent to others to prove anything. We're sent to present. This is Jesus on the cross. This is what he's done in my life. This is what he promises to do to you. This is the good news. This is the gospel. Everything in the world has been arranged to get you to this moment. If they reject what you say, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus. And that's the whole point. You see, we're not lifting you up to be believed because you can't save them. What God's doing is he's lifting Jesus up to be believed because he can. See, sometimes we're so arrogant, we think that we're the ones that have to save people. I've never saved a person in my life. It's not our job to save. It's our job to present Jesus. I'm going to be the best representative of my Savior that I can be. God, you send me into the darkness and I'll shine a light for you. I'm not perfect, but I'll reflect the best I can. And then you go to them and you say, here's what he's done in my life. And you say, Jesus has been lifted up. Make a decision. You're either going to accept him or reject him, but you're not going to impact me. You see, after the cross-examination, God leaves it to the jury. He leaves it to people to make a decision. Cross-examinations don't determine the truth. They just reveal the truth that was there all along. I'm not trying to convince you of my life. I'm trying to show you Jesus in my life. The next time you go to see somebody and you know they desperately need to know the truth and you're fearful of rejection, remember they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Jesus. So when you go to them, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this incredible study. I thank you, God, that you want us to take your love to everybody. It's so much easier to take your love home than it is to take it to people that we know have rejected you. But God, there are people out there that you've been preparing. You've moved their hearts. You've arranged the issues of their life. They're ready to hear the gospel message, and we, God, need to be prepared and planned, and we need to be ready to go share the message. God, in your word, I'm reminded that the prophet said, here I am, send me. Here I am, God, send me. God, would you take every person in this room, prepare their hearts, let them shine with Jesus in their hearts, let them live in the moment, and then send them out to help people who are going to go to hell if they don't know who you are. And let us lift Christ up and allow people to examine him and cross-examine him. Because some are going to fall on their faces and surrender. God, help us to be effective witnesses for you. And we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen.